Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia announced the country's withdrawal from the European Council as a way to cope with the international siege campaign. Venezuela ratified educational cooperation plans in the specialty of medicines to alleviate the needs of the region and other peoples. And the Iranian government accuses the United States for intentionally mixing up the resumption of the nuclear talks and for showing no interest to reach an agreement. Hi, this is From the South, and your news anchor deal my team from the Tulsar Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. While the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia announced the country's withdrawal from the European Council as a way to cope with the international pressure, now the Eurasian country's foreign ministry indicated that in accordance with the organization's procedures, Russia will immediately begin the process and its withdrawal from the organization will be effective at the end of this year. Among the reasons for the separation, the foreign affairs portfolio argued that the European Union and NATO are abusing their absolute majority in the body's committee of ministers to take hostile actions against Russia to the detriment of the spirit of the common humanitarian space that governs it. Also, Russian President Vladimir Putin held a cabinet meeting on Thursday to discuss plans to minimize the impact of international sanctions on the Russian economy. At the meeting, Russia's finance minister Anton Silvanov said the West has launched a financial and economic war against Russia. He said keeping the country's financial system running normally is a priority and that the country has already taken steps to attract foreign capital. Meanwhile, Putin said Russia is meeting its energy supply commitments to Europe and other parts of the world despite unilateral sanctions imposed by the West on Moscow. He urged the West not to blame Russia for rising energy prices. He said Biden's comments on gas prices hikes in the U.S. being somehow the responsibility of Russia are deceitful. During a meeting with members of the government, the Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Western sanctions on Moscow began to hurt the United States and Europe. And the prices there are rising, but that's not our fault. This is the result of the own miscalculations. There is nothing to blame on us. They are already trying at all costs to come to agreement with the countries against them themselves have imposed in limiting restrictions, and they are ready to make peace with Iran and immediately sign all the documents, and with Venezuela. They went to Venezuela to negotiate with them. On Thursday, the Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Western country sanctions on Moscow could send global food prices soaring as Russia and Belarus are the two of the world's main producers of fertilizer, which is essential for the global supply chains, especially of the food ones. Russia and Belarus are some of the biggest suppliers of mineral fertilizers. If they to continue to create problems for the financing and logistics of the delivery of our goods, then prices will rise and this will affect the final products, food products. And Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Russia will overcome Western penalties for the special military operation in Ukraine. He acknowledged that the population may be worried about an interruption of supplies, but claimed there was nothing the country and its people could not solve. The pressure of sanctions has always existed. Of course, today it is more complicated nature and it poses certain questions, problems and difficulties on us. But we will overcome them just now, like we have overcome problems in previous years. I have no doubt that we will achieve the goals which are ahead of us, in this case the economy, and by that mean increasing of economic sovereignty. On Thursday, the effects of the Western country sanctions on Russia are already being felt in their own territories with a sharp rise in oil and gas prices across the European continent, as is the case of Italy. Italian drivers are struggling as the sanctions against Russia affect fuel costs with oil prices now above 2 euros, 2.2 US dollars per liter due to the turmoil on in the international oil market. Italy's main oil company Eni, ENI, announced on Thursday that it would suspend all new oil contracts with Russia, but banning all Russian oil imports is a complicated issue because Italy imports 40% of its gas and 13% of its oil from Russia. Compared to last year, when the fuel price was expensive at that time, people got angry. Now they have given up. Now it was supposed to be the moment to restart. And this recovery is obviously very slow due to recent events. So we can say that the problem is that we reduce our fees for clients. But the costs that we are facing have doubled. So there is more fear. Fear of not making it. 
We are losing hope. Russia's Defense Ministry spokesperson Major General Igor Konashenkov said on Thursday that a strike on a children's hospital in the southeastern Ukrainian port city of Mariupol is a staged provocation by Ukraine. The Russian aviation carry out absolutely no missions to hit targets on the ground in the Mariupol area. The analysis of the statements of representatives of the Kiev nationalist regime, photographic material from the hospital, leaves no doubt. The airstrike that allegedly took place is a complete stage provocation to maintain anti Russian hype for a Western audience. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. The president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, ratified the education cooperation plans and the specialty of medicine that the nation is carrying out with countries in the region in order to alleviate the needs of other people. The head of state highlighted the importance of Venezuela's educational cooperation in the programs of the Bolivarian Alliance. The president's statements were made during the graduation ceremony of at least 1,864 new community health professionals from the Solidarity with the Peoples of the World graduating class, which included medical graduates from countries such as Palestine, Brazil, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Colombia. In this regard, Maduro has assured that he will offer close to 1,000 scholarships for medical training to young people from Colombia, Brazil, the United States, and the whole region. Hello, I would like to train a graduate in the Sabor Allende University at least 1,000 comprehensive community physicians for Colombia per year, only for Colombia. That needs so much public health that has no health. You could say these are very big dreams. The big dreams at the Utopia, if Fidel Archales had not set such immense dreams, the Sabor Allende University would never be born and you wouldn't have never graduated. In addition to Colombia, the Venezuelan head of state also expressed that he plans to graduate and provide scholarships in medicine to near a thousand students from Brazil, Haiti, and the United States. We are going to train a thousand young people in three public and quality education so that they can practice comprehensive community medicine for the people of Colombia and all of Latin America, Brazil, the Caribbean, Haiti. Central America and the United States of America, so that the youth of the United States can come and forge their careers. Venezuela's Minister of Energy and Petroleum, Turek El Asaime, informed that the South American country's oil industry is prepared to increase its oil production to 2 million barrels per day. El Asaime said that after the sanctions imposed by the United States against his country, the state-owned Petróleos de Venezuela, PDVSA, relied on the wisdom of its workers and the national and scientific development to innovate valves and other parts that the company could not buy in the international market due to the restrictions against the country. On Thursday, in a televised address, the constitutional president of the Republic of Guatemala, Alejandro Yamate, gave his people an official message. During the official release, the Guatemalan president announced that Initiative 52-72, which was presented by several deputies to the Congress of the Republic and gave rise to Decree 18-2022, Law for the Protection of Life and the Family, was not sent by the executive. The president added that his government rejects this initiative. He informed the nation that he officially requested the president of the le legislative body that the Congress of the Republic dismiss it. He ratified that otherwise, if the law reaches his office, it will be vetoed. On March 8, the Congress of the Republic was informed of Initiative 5272, was presented by several deputies to the Congress of the Republic, which gave rise to Decree 18 2022, the law for the protection of life and the family. In the first place, I want to clarify that this initiative was not sent by the executive, and secondly, we cannot agree. Despite the coincidence, with the fact that Guatemala has been declared the Ibero-American capital for life, we cannot link one thing to, with the other. I explain the reasons. Decree Law 18-2022 violates two conventions to which Guatemala is a signatory. It contains technical differences in its drafting, but the most worrisome about it that it violates the political constitution of the Republic. 
I have contact the president of the agency body to request that the Congress to report saying this law to file it. The British Labour Party Member of Parliament Jeremy Corbyn visited Chile. During his visit, he paid his respects to the heroic Salvador Allende, and there he was interviewed by Telesur. His legacy is a very important one. It's, at a personal level, one of incredible bravery in the way that he stood firm against the military who were trying to take over the country and subsequently lost his life doing that. But I think the longer legacy is that he was obviously a socialist, obviously a Marxist all his life, campaigned on those points and those principles, eventually won an election and then mobilized huge forces to bring about social change, social justice, housing, full employment, public ownership. Corbyn was asked what advice he would give to Chilean President-elect Gabriel Boric. He replied that he wishes him well for his term in office and that he needs to hold firm to his political principles. It's a very tough fight he's taking on. He'll be given a lot of advice from people that do not wish him well and do not wish the social changes he wants to bring about well. He's going to have to stand up for the principles that he won the election on. Social justice, good education, free health care protect the environment, but above all, let's create a world fit for the next generation, not bequeath them environmental destruction, poverty and war. It's a United States unilateral restrictions on charter flights to Cuba are still in force after two years. The extraterritorial measure implemented by Donald Trump's government bans all flight arrivals at provincial airports and forces all U.S. aircrafts to land in Havana and their passenger to incur additional money expenses and waste of time and efforts in overland transfers. Cuban Prime Minister Manuel Marrero denounced that such a measure, which also includes the closing of consular services in the island, intends to isolate the Cuban families and to strengthen the U.S. economic warfare on Cuba. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. The Iranian government accuses the United States for intentionally mixing up the resumption of the nuclear talks and for showing no interest to reach an agreement. The Secretary of the Supreme Council for National Security, Ali Shamjani, affirmed that while his country is searching for options to reestablish the accord, the U.S. position in relation to Iran's principal demands is unreasonable. Mr. Shamjani also stated that his pressure for the agreement is an indication of the United States' lack of interest in reaching a stable one. Iran has so far announced its withdrawal from its commitments on several accord issues after the U.S. unilaterally pulled out of the agreements during 2018. On Thursday, the government of Syria examined sanctions imposed by the United States and its allies, which they say prevent them from setting up conditions for the return of Syrian refugees to the country. Syria's Foreign Minister Fazal al-Maghdad said his government is making great efforts to ensure the basic needs of Syrian citizens, but that U.S. and European restrictions impact every aspect of daily life and hinder the return of people to their homes. Likewise, Syria requests the International Organization for Migration to prioritize humanitarian assistance in keeping with humanitarian principles, and they vow to continue working with the set organization on the basis of mutual trust and cooperation. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, a country's highest political advisory body, closed its annual session with calls for greater contributions to achieve the Asian giant's socioeconomic development and growth goals. On the other side of Asia, conservative Yoon suk yeol was elected president of South Korea. A correspondent, Irem Zibarasa, brings us the details. The annual session of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference concluded today with calls for great contributions to the fulfillment of socio-economic goals and efforts to safeguard national security and stability. Together with the National People's Congress, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference makes up what is known here as the two sessions, meaning two of the most important political events of the year in China. From high-tech entrepreneurs to ethnic minority social leaders, the annual session of the consultative conference brought together some 2,000 advisors from all walks of life for a week at the Grand People's Palace in Beijing to gather their views on laws and plans that will define the course of the Asian giants. 
At the closing session, the chairman of this body, Wang Yan, assured that one of the priorities of this year has been to contribute to the stability and strengthening of the construction of socialism with Chinese characteristics. He stressed the importance of the concluding session as the prelude to the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China and the need for Chinese advisors to continue contributing to the party's leadership and the consolidation of socialist democracy. During this annual session, Chinese policy advisors made more than 1,000 proposals aimed at sustaining achievements in poverty reduction, strengthening health policies, green development, and ensuring economic stability. On the other hand, today China has reported 528 new cases of COVID-19, the highest number of daily infections since the first of half of the 2020 due to the active outbreaks, especially of the Omicron variant. Most of the infections, exactly 402, were locally transmitted in more than a dozen provinces and regions of the country. In the middle of this resurgency of cases, national authorities insist on strengthening in zero tolerance policy to the virus and call for calm and avoid panic, assuring that rapid response measures have been taken and most cases have been detected in quarantine sites. While in South Korea, conservative opposition leader Yoon suk Yeol was elected president of the country in one of the most contested elections in that nation's history. Young narrowly defeated his rival, Lee Ya Yuin, the Democratic Party's candidate of current president, Moon Hain, who was banned by the Constitution from running for re elections. The new president will take office for five years on May 10th and will have to face challenges such as the worst wave of COVID-19, growing inequality and public discontent over the housing crisis. During his administration, a more aggressive foreign policy is expected, especially towards North Korea, as June is considered a hardliner towards the neighboring country, although he did not close the door to dialogue. <laughs> this is the situation on this side of the world. We will be back with more news from the Asian continent in the next days. See you soon. In Nicaragua, the national government issued a call to the population over two years of age to complete the vaccination schedule against COVID-19. According to the Ministry of Public Health, 89% of the Nicaraguan citizens are immunized with at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, while 65% have been administered the complete scheme. In this sense, the pediatric population between the ages of 2 and 17 years old who have received the Cuban Soberana Abdala vaccines are also included in the new scheme. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website, Tell Us Our English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tell Us Our English, I'm Diego Martin. Thanks for watching.